So, good morning everyone. My name is Andrea Zanotti and I'm going to present a part of my PhD thesis work that consists in the creation of an agent basin model to simulate the, the expansion of the first farmers in the Balkans. So, well, the first question is why am I making this agent basin model? Because actually this topic has been pretty much studied in archaeology, so why to add an agent basin model? Well, the answer is that Lion. What we know from archaeology is just based on what can be found in excavations. So mostly C14 dates and the analysis of cultural similarities. In this way, we know quite a lot about the path and the timing of the expansion. The problem is there are, that there are many things that are actually invisible or hidden in archaeology. For example, we don't know almost anything about the socio-economic structures of the prehistoric societies. So that's why I built this agent basin model because with this comprehensive approach that integrates data from several disciplines such as ethnography or uh, paleoenvironmental sciences, it's possible to try to test um, uh, and explore scenarios that would be hard to be detected in archaeology. So I will start describing quite shortly how did we model that, so the agent basin model. Starting from the agent, so the agent that we are simulating is a household and in this specific archaeological context, a household seems to correspond to a nuclear family because those houses are really pretty small, so it's very unlikely to imagine that they were occupied by more than one nuclear family. So essentially, an agent is composed by the couple of parents plus the unmarried children. And also, each household owns a herd of uh, sheep goats, cattle and pigs that are the most important species that are found in the Neolithic assemblages. And the agents interact in, a, in an environment, uh, so the whole region is divided in pixel of one square kilometer, so that's the basic unit of information for a total or more or less 750,000 pixels. And each pixel has a best patch value, that's what we call best patch value, that represents how likely, uh, how likely is it to be occupied by the settlers. So I'm gonna show you that best patch map. I don't know how clear it is, but there are different shades of green. So each pixel has a value that goes from one to zero, where one is the green and means that this pixel, pixel is really, really good for farming, while zero is red and means that this pixel is awful and nobody will never wanna go there. And we model these values uh, using uh, several <coughs> environmental variables, such as the um, uh, precipitations and temperature, soil fertility estimates, as well as the elevation of each pixel and also the actual pres presence or absence of um, Neolithic size as its weight on this value. So the black dots are, uh, actually represent the Neolithic size, and you can see that the, almost all of them fall in pretty good areas for farming. And um, so, yeah, also several agents on the same pixel represents a hamlet. Indeed, if you think to several houses on, at the same spot, it's a village, right? Um, to show you how the model works, I'm gonna sh uh, show that through that uh, diagram, since it's a, maybe it's a little bit complex, I think it would be easier to understand. So starting from the initialization, uh, a certain number of agents is created in the started zone, all together with their animals. So the starting zone, just for information, corresponds more or less to the Aegean region, so the Aegean coast of the Greece. That's where almost all the, um, where all the oldest Neolithic sites have been found. And then the model starts running the first season, uh, indeed, every step of the simulation corresponds to a calendar season, so autumn, uh, winter, spring, and summer, and so on. And the first thing that happens is that the climate is updated. So for each pixel in the model, there is a simulation of the precipitation and of the temperature. We did this starting from some pollen data that we have for the, for the region and for the period that we are interested in. That's more or less this, just after the 8.2 event. And so each pixel simulates its precipitation area and its temperature, and this also affects the soil fertility. So the soil fertility can be increased or decreased according to the, the climate. And that happens for each pixel. And then we can simulate the behavior of the agents. And we do that through what we call the partial intermediate models. So essentially the model has two different levels, that is the economic and the demographic. So Starting from the economic, why do we talk about the economy? I mean, obviously there is no a market, so uh, at least that's what we think. So people do not produce for the commerce, for trading, but it's rather for their survival. I mean, what's the goal of the agents is to survive. And in order to do that, uh, agents need to gather um, a certain amount of kilocalories. 
And the main activity that they did in the Neolithic is the farming activity. So we model the functioning of that intensive farming system. Intensive means that there is a high input of labor on relatively small plots. And so uh, we, there are different seasonal activities such as like sowing, weeding, picking, etc. And also manuring. Indeed, the manure was proven to be very important to increase the soil fertility already during the early Neolithic. So animals are important also for the production of manure, manure other than obviously for the meat that they, they can give to the, to the agents. And while hunting gathering seems to be pretty marginal during the Neolithic, so they are considered just complementary activities. Agents can go hunting gathering just if they need more calories, they didn't get enough from the farming and herding activity. And in case that the farming production is not enough, there can be crises. So there can be shortages and famines. They have, there are different scales of intensity that have been modeled according to uh, historical crises that we found in the region in the bibliography. And the consequence is obviously the death of individuals and animals. But at the same time, agents can try to react. They can try to move to neighbors or to um, uh, relatives that, in, that are in areas that are not hit, and hit by the crisis to try to survive and to avoid that. And that's generally how it works, the economic part. Then, then there is the demography. So individuals within households follow demographic cycles. They can die, marry, and reproduce uh, according to pre-industrial population life tables. And I'm putting a lot of emphasis on the marriage because the marriage is particular in this context because the marriage, since we are simulating nuclear households, the agent is a nuclear family, the marriage corresponds to the creation of a new nuclear family, therefore a new agent. And I will make that quite short. So essentially, not all the agents can stay in the same pixel, in the same hamlet. There will be a certain moment that the new agent will not be accepted anymore. And that is what will trigger the colonization. So if the, that agent is not accepted in the, in the hamlet, he will have to leave to colonize a new area on the best patch. And he will live with his parents. So actually an um, ethnographic suggestion that shows that is really unlikely to have a pioneer front of colonization just composed of just married couples. There will be a big imbalance between producer and consumers. And that's why some ethnographic sources suggest that they could live to colonize with the parents. So that's what we did in the model. And then, well, obviously like the next season is simulated till when we go to the end of the, of the, the simulations. And we have, we have a lot of results. Uh, we have on a local scale, so for each agent, we know its geographic position and its composition, as well as its social and economic behavior. So their kinship and the splits and their active farming activity, etc. And on a global scale, so for the whole model, we have um, information about the, the economic system. So how much was produced, how many animals are in the model, etc. And on the demographic structure, so we know how many individuals are in the model, how many villages, how many people died, etc. And we also know. Uh, we have a, some crisis maps, so we know where the crisis happened, how bad they were, how many people died, etc. Um, so I will talk a little bit about how after I tested the model, so after performing simulation, I could I test it. And actually that was really problematic, I won't lie to you, I was struggling a lot doing that. I mean, I think that maybe everybody does, but in my case I was having a lot of differences. Because I mean, I was trying to compare what I expect, like what I see in archaeology, what I expect the model to do to what can actually be observed in the model. The problem is that, I mean, I think that this is dif difficult for everyone. But in my case, it's particularly difficult because this region has a lot of problems in archaeology. For example, there are very, very few skeletons, and that makes almost impossible to do any kind of polydemographic inference. And also there is the absence of completely excavated sites, and uh, some, many sites have very complex stratifications. So actually a lot of things that we think we know from archaeology are just come from estimates, so we don't really have archaeological data to compare, we just have estimates to compare, so I mean, it was really problematic. But at the contrary, at least, we have quite a lot of georeferenced sites. I mean, I know more or less 900 sites, and I know their geographical, geographic coordinates, as well as more or less their, I can place them in a quite precise typochronological sequence. I mean, I can know for each site, more or less, in which period it was occupied. So. Essentially, all the tests that I made uh, of the model and all the criteria of validation are based essentially on geographical criteria. So this is just an example to compare the, the patterns that we see in archaeology to the patterns that are simulated um, by the model. 
Uh, in particular, just to explain some tests that I did, I tried to compare different expansion areas at several consecutive archaeological points in time. What does this mean? This means that we know more or less that some areas are occupied in archaeology in a certain period, and we expect the agents to go in those areas at the same period, in, at the same time. Obviously, not just two precise points, but in several areas in several different chronological times. I also tried to compare the, the configuration of the points, so really the, um, their, their location and their relative positions to try to find eventual, like some similarities. Also comparing the space-time density of hamlets. Um, that's not very easy actually to compare the density because the I mean, the excavated sites have not been excavated with the same quality in all the region. I mean, there are some regions that have been very, very well excavated, while other regions for which we know much less. But there are some regions that actually have been very well prospected. So I try to compare the density of those regions to the density produced by the model. And also, for example, comparing the speed of the expansion, so the pace of the advance of the Neolithic that we see in archaeology to the, the advance that we have in the model. And I thought this, this was a pretty big part of my thesis. And I've, I've been working quite a lot on this, and I think it would be really interesting to talk more about this. And also, I think it can also give some results, because as I said before, a lot of things that we know actually come from just estimates. So I think that like just managing to reproduce a good geographical expansion can give us quite a lot of ideas about which estimates could actually be good and which other at the country seemed completely wrong. But I'm not really going to talk about that, because I think that would be maybe more interesting to explore some outputs as I was saying at the beginning, I'm trying with this model to try to see some things that are not really clear, not evident in archaeology. So I'm going to show you some examples of some ideas that came to me after modeling. And one of these is about the, the size of a nuclear family. Well, uh, archaeologists in general claim that the Neolithic houses in the region could have more or less six, seven persons in the house. And this, is, this estimate is made purely on the size of the house. I mean, they know the size and they say, yeah, in this house there will be more or less six, seven persons. And then, after we can estimate the size of the Neolithic village, so you know that there could be like 30 simultaneous houses. So making just the multiplication, you can note that there could be more or less 200 inhabitants. The problem is that the model, the set size of the village is much smaller. And what's the reason? It's actually, I decided to follow the life of a household in order to understand the reason, because the average size of the household is not six, seven persons, as the archaeological say, it's something like 3.5. And I said, okay, why? Maybe, I mean, maybe the model is wrong, so I decided to see what happens in a household. This is just an example, but more or less all the households do the same. And when a household is created in the model, there are just two persons that are actually the couple that just married. And then, absolutely, the size of the household increases to our new inhabitants. So this is, on the horizontal axis, this is the time from the creation of the household, and this is the number of persons. And actually, there is a moment that there are six, seven persons, in this case, even eight persons in the household, so as the archaeologists say. But then there is a, a, a very sudden decrease of, of persons in the house because like, the children become adults and they marry, and the parents at the same time, maybe they die. So what do I think? I think that actually, when the archaeologists say that the houses have six, seven persons, I actually say, should rather say that the houses can have up to six, seven persons. But I think that it's very unlikely that in a village where there are maybe 30 houses, all the houses will be occupied by six, seven persons simultaneously. There will be some houses maybe with big families, but also some houses where there is a just married couple, and also some houses where maybe there are just the old couple of parents whose children already left the house and they are just waiting to die. So, I mean, I think that in general there could be um, what the model suggests. And what I think that actually could be true is that there could be a general overestimate that we make in archaeology if we think that in every single household there are seven, six, seven persons simultaneously. And also another thing that I'm going to describe quite shortly is the number of generated houses. So I will just remind you the assumption that I made at the beginning. So is that every single household, of course, should technically should build their own house. So in the model, we should expect to see more or less the same number of nuclear families that to then the number of archaeological houses if every single nuclear family was building their own house. The problem is that actually that's not what we really see, because the model produces more many nuclear families than the houses that we find in archaeology. And also that like raises new questions. 
what's the reason? Like one reason can actually be that simply the model is wrong and I'm overestimating the creation of nuclear families. Or maybe the archaeological estimates are wrong and there were more, more houses than what we really think. Or maybe that actually the assumption of nuclear families is wrong and in some cases two families could live in the same house. But there is an hypothesis that I particularly like and that I want to describe now. And it's about the reoccupation or rebuilding of the house on the same spot. Because, like, think for example in some cases if a family leaves the house or because they migrate or because they die early, but the house is still in good conditions. I'm particularly thinking about Greece. In Greece the houses are typically, typically mud brick houses that can have pretty long life duration. And furthermore, in Greece you find some sites that have really thick and really robust stone foundations. So, also I tried to look in ethnography and I think that it's not that improbable that in some cases just the same house could be reoccupied. And that could partially explain the difference, the higher number of nuclear families produced by the mo model than the number of archaeological houses. Obviously this is just an hypothesis, but I think maybe it would be interesting to try to see if in archaeology it's possible to assess the duration of a house to see if it's possible that actually more than one generation of people were living in the same house. And another thing that I think is pretty interesting is the hunting on the Pioneer Front. Well, when I talk about Pioneer Front, I talk about areas that were not occupied earlier. So just areas of colonization. And I decided to follow a, a sample of 50 different villages that are just created on the a, on a Pioneer Front, so just uh, colons. And so this is the, the time, the relative time, so from the moment of their foundation till like 100 years. And this is the kilo colors that they get from hunting. And what do we see? We see that at the beginning, like the first 30 years, people hunt a lot. People go hunting a lot. And then there is a very big decrease. And after 50 years, like almost nobody hunts anymore. And so I started thinking about that. And from the point of view of the model, that actually makes perfectly sense. Because when people arrive to colonize an area, they have a very small herd. And so you cannot eat all the herd. I mean, if you have a few animals and you eat them after you will have no animals anymore, that would be not really a wise behavior. But after like 50 years or after like 30 years anyway, you start having a pretty big and a big, big herd. You have many more animals. So you can afford to kill the animals regularly without affecting their reproductivity. So from the modeling point of view, that actually makes sense to me. The problem is that that's not what we see in archaeology. So this, those are quite a lot of sites that are in the region and that have a pretty long duration of occupation. And this is the contribution of wild animals. And you can see that like, there is not that any kind of clear pattern of like, reduction of hunting. I mean, maybe some sites do, but anyway, all the sites still go hunting, even after several centuries. What does this mean? Well, the first thing, it means that like, I'm almost sure that my model is wrong. Why? Because the point is that people don't go, actually, I started looking in the ethnography too. And I see that people don't go hunting just because they need kilocalories as the model Suggest like in my model people goes hunting just for kilocalories for food But in reality there are so many reasons for which people can go hunting It can be just a reason of prestige like to increase the social status Or it can be just to get some resources that you get from wild animals such as pelt, far, tusks, horn Or just even to have fun So well I mean I'm just going to jump to the conclusions I'm, This model managed to reproduce pretty well the geographic expansion And I mean this is good I'm happy about this um, but at the same time, I, I think that the model is good even when it's wrong. Especially when I'm trying to compare the socioeconomic outputs to the few things that I can detect in archaeology. I'm finding quite a lot of differences. But I think that this is not that bad. Because, I mean, even when the model is wrong, we still learn. Because that will help us to think <clears throat> why the model was wrong. What did, we didn't we take in account something when we were modeling. So I think that at least personally, at the end of that modeling processes, I know much more than what I knew, I knew before. And anyway, at least I have new hypotheses, new ideas that maybe can be added to archaeological research. Uh, yeah, I think that's it. Thank you.